Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Otem and today we'll talk about mensural notation. From the late 13th century and until the 17th century, so-called mensural notation was used. As opposed to earlier rhythmic notation, Mensual notation allowed an accurate and at times very complicated way of communicating how long or short notes are in relation to one another. Without such a system, it would have been impossible to create intricate polyphonic music, where the different voices rely on each other in order to work together. In this episode, we will present the basics of the mensural notation. Let's start. To begin with, we must remind ourselves of the note values their names and what they look like. To do so, we will use their 16th century forms. Originally, back in the 13th century, the note system was based on two main values, a long one and a short one, or in Latin, a longa and a brevis. In the 14th century, in the period which is often referred to as Ars Nova, further values were regularly used. Shorter than the brevis was the semibrevis, even shorter the minima, and even shorter the semiminima. The minima, despite its name, is not the shortest value in the system. However, until the middle of the 16th century, it was the shortest value that could carry its own text syllable. A note value longer than the longa, which was also the longest in the system, is the maxima, hence its name. In the end of the 15th century, notes shorter than the semiminima were introduced, fusa and semifusa. Lastly, in the 16th century, an even shorter note value was introduced, the fusella. Notice, these specific graphical representations of the notes are according to the so-called white notation, that utilizes hollow note shapes. This was used from roughly the middle of the 15th century. Before that, with the so-called black notation, all the notes were filled in. Also, these are the Latin names of the note values. From now on, I will refer to their English names, long, brief, semi-brief, etc. Now, what would be the fun of it if the notes were to simply appear one after the other? Why not create an elaborate system of abbreviations to make things a bit more complicated? Such a system was established in the 13th century, a system of ligatures that combines several signs together. Sometimes a ligature was used to indicate that it should be sung on one text syllable, like a modern slur in a way. But sometimes it was merely a calligraphic flourish with no further meaning beyond that of the note values it represented. Just like complicated grammar of languages, the system of ligatures might seem at first like an illogical set of random rules, but originally it did have a certain logic to it. It starts with the basic ligature of a brief and a long. When descending it looks like this, and when ascending it looks like this. Memorizing it wouldn't be a bad idea, as any other ligature is a variation of these. Don't feel bad if you can't find logic in them though, they originate from the rhythmic notation of the Notre Dame school in the 13th century. We just have to accept them as they are. This is a brief and this is a long. The idea was that any change that is made to either note inverts its meaning. For example, when descending, if the stem of the first note were omitted, it would invert its meaning and become a long. And similarly, when ascending, if a stem were added to the first note, it would invert its meaning and become a long. Going back to the basic form, if now the second note were transformed, either by becoming oblique when descending, or by flipping its flag direction when ascending, its meaning would be inverted. And here is the fourth option. This is the basic idea, but already by the 16th century, this approach to ligatures declined, and the treatises followed a more pragmatic way of teaching it, namely dry rules that determine what is the first, middle, or last note of a ligature. 
check out the footnotes to see which approach you prefer. Before sending you home to practice reading ligatures, here are two further basic and useful rules. One, in the case of ligatures with more than two notes, each note, which is not the first or the last, is a brief. Two, when the first note of a ligature has a stem from above, it means that this note and the one following it are both semi-briefs. This rule overrides other rules. This ligature was almost the only one that stayed in use by the end of the 16th century. The other ones died out. Are you confused? Well, it's very confusing. But I can tell you that I personally know people who can read ligatures fluently. It's completely possible. It only takes a bit of practice. Let's continue to the core of the menstrual system. At this point, one might think that note values in old times had perhaps different names and different graphical representations, but are essentially equivalent to modern notation. This, however, is very far from the truth. Modern notation, which is in fact not so different from the notation that was used already in the 17th century, has absolute values. That is, a whole note, for example, contains two half notes, and a half note contains two quarter notes. In the old mensural system, however, things were more elaborate. Each note value could be either perfect, that is, ternary, made out of three parts, or imperfect, binary, made out of two parts. The first two levels, at the values of the maxima and of the long, were sometimes called maximodus and modus, and could be either perfect or imperfect. However, from the end of the 14th century, they were mostly considered imperfect by default, containing only two smaller note values. The next two levels, though, those of the briefs and semi-briefs, were very much the center of attention, and especially so in the 15th century. These were called tempus and prolatio. In order to mark whether these notes were perfect or imperfect at the beginning of each piece, a simple representation method was devised. The tempus was marked with a circle. If it were complete, it meant that it was perfect, that is, each brief was made up of three semi-briefs. And if it were incomplete, a half circle, it was imperfect, made of only two semi-briefs. Then the prolatio, if it were perfect, was marked with a dot. And it meant that the semi-brief was made of three minims. The absence of a dot meant that the prolatio was imperfect, with only two minims in each semibrief. Thus, as can be seen in this diagram from Pietro Aron's treatise from 1523, four central mensurations were established, each with its own sign. Circle with a dot, perfect tempus with perfect prolatio, half a circle with a dot, imperfect tempus with perfect prolatio, circle with no dot, perfect tempus with imperfect prolatio, and lastly, half a circle with no dot, imperfect tempus with imperfect prolatio. It should be said that these four mensurations were mostly used in the 15th century. By the 16th century, although they are still mentioned in almost all the treatises, they were seldom used in actual music. Notice, however, the last mensuration and its C sign, where everything is imperfect. Out of these four, it was the only one used throughout the 16th century. In fact, this mensuration is the basis of the modern notation system as you know it. It is not by chance that it was later termed common time. So, these are the basics. Unfortunately, however, there are still some details to learn before it will be possible for you to read mensual notation, and especially that of music before the 16th century. We cannot really teach all of it here, but just so you'll get an idea, here are two important points, imperfection and alteration. Up to this point, we showed how under different mensurations, the absolute value of notes can be different. For example, in perfect tempus, a brief would have the length of three semi-briefs, and in perfect prolatio, 
a semibrieve would have the length of three minims. This is great, but how can one notate an imperfect note then? One that has the length of only two smaller values. In modern notation, as everything is absolute, there is no such problem. If, for example, we want a note to include three half notes, we would write a whole note with a dot. And if we then want it to be worth only two half notes, we would take away the dot. In mensural notation, this is usually not indicated by extra graphical signs. Instead, it should be understood from the context, whether a perfect note is indeed perfect or not. A basic rule is that a note, which is perfect according to the mensuration, always stays perfect when followed by another note of the same value. For example, in perfect tempus, this first brief will always be perfect. But, if it is followed or preceded by the next smaller note value, the perfect note would become imperfect. And together with the smaller note, they would constitute one perfect unit. Ta, ta, ta. In some cases, a dot of perfection was needed in order to define the perfect units. Ta, ta, ta. Notice, this dot should not be confused with the dot we know from today the dot of augmentation, which was also used back then. These rules made it so that some specific rhythms cannot be expressed. For example, if we added a brief at the end of this example, due to the rule we mentioned, the brief before it would be perfect. But what if we wanted it to stay imperfect? Then we would need to use the rule of alteration. When two semi-briefs are surrounded by longer notes, the second one would be altered to the value of an imperfect brief. In that case, the dot is no longer needed. Ta, 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 ta. And of course, all these rules apply in all perfect mensurations. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the intricate and confusing rules concerning imperfection and alteration. And we had to skip other important details such as the many meanings that colored notes may have. If you want, you could learn more in the quite good Wikipedia article about it. Now, let's see the powers of the mensural notation. What awesome things it can do. As opposed to modern notation, where a single time signature is mostly used for all the voices, in mensural notation, it is quite common that each voice has a different mensuration. Moreover, it is also possible to indicate that certain parts should be executed according to a certain proportion. Twice as fast, twice as slow, and also three times as fast or slow. In fact, any conceivable mathematical proportion was theoretically possible. This made the system extremely complicated and filled theory books with countless signs and incomprehensible tables. At the same time, it also offered composers the opportunity to show off their genius. By applying different mensurations and proportions to a single clever melody, different parts are created. This was called a mensural canon. This, for example, is a little duet from Josquin's Missa lo marmé super voces musicales, a mass full of such mensural tricks. You see that there is only one part, but two mensural signs. The upper one we presented above, imperfect tempus with imperfect prolatio, the mensural sign that was later named common time. The lower one is the same but with a stroke through it. This sign was later called alla breve. We mentioned the significance of these signs in another episode. In this specific context, the stroke means that all the note values are diminished by half. So by composing one line of music, there are in fact two voices, one sung as it is, and one that is twice as fast. Jacob will join me and will sing it for you. The Anus Day from the same mass is even more elaborate, with three voices, one normal, one double speed, and one triple speed. 
The starting note of each voice is not clear from this part alone, but Glaran, in his famous 1547 treatise, solved this for us. The top part should start on a D, the middle one on the A below it, and the lowest one on the D below. So that you may appreciate exactly how it works, I will let the computer play it. It seems as if the ternary and binary divisions create a weird effect, one which we do not often hear. Some composers took the same idea even further, and the results are no less weird. Check the details in the footnotes if you wish. Over the course of the 16th century, after almost three centuries, the mensural system's reign over music slowly declined. The vast majority of music came to be composed in imperfect common time and alla breve. And of all the intricate ligatures, only the semi-breve pair stayed in use. Despite that, many 16th century writers continue to write about the mensural system in much detail. Pietro Aron, Giovanni Maria Lanfranco, and Heinrich Glarian, just to name a few. However, other theorists were torn between respect to their old masters and distaste for the complicated mensural system. Scholars such as Vicentino, Zarlino, and Tigrini believed that instead of improving the music, the impressive mathematical intricacies of this system did just the opposite. Zarlino complained that many music theory books dealt only with circles and semicircles. So many dots, rests, colors, ciphers, signs, ratios, and other strange things that they appear to be the books kept by an intricate business house. He concluded that all these signs are subject to the sense of sight rather than to the sense of hearing. This episode was just a taste of what the mensual notation can offer. If you find it interesting, do go on and look at music from these fascinating eras that are a bit earlier than the music we normally discuss on this show. Many thanks to Ozan Karagöz and Yason Marmaras for helping me write this episode. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.